we're going to talk today about why it's important to hear the voice of God. Anybody ever thought about that? Like, well, I wish I could hear the voice of God more. Okay, three of us. Uh, anybody, anybody else uh, at, in the chapel, maybe at home? Okay, thank you. Uh, in the back. No, I want to learn how to hear the voice of God. I want to learn how to listen better. You know, one of the challenges as parents we face is trying to get our children to listen to us, amen, like, like just to hear it. And, and it's a couple stages I've learned. When they're real little and you speak to them, they don't hear a thing, right? And then when they get older and you speak to them, they hear, but they don't understand what you're saying. And then when they get to the age mine are now, they don't listen at all. They want you to listen to them because they know better than you, right? <laughs> like, like that, like I hear this regularly. You think you know everything, huh, Dad? No, I don't know everything, but I know this is not right, you know? So uh, one of the crazy things is, and I've learned this as I've gotten older, the older I get, the smarter my parents get, right? Like my age, my parents are geniuses, right? <laughs> and uh, I want you to know that if you're a young person in here today, listen to me. If your parents are telling you to do something, it's always for your good, I promise you. You may not understand it, you don't believe it, you may not get it, uh, you may not even like it, but you have to understand when your parents say something to you, it's for your good. And God's the same way, right? Like we don't always understand the commands and the promises of God, but God's plans are always for you to prosper. I want you to hear this right out the gate today. God is for you. You need to hear this. God is for you, he loves you, he wants the best for you, and his voice is a voice that could be trusted above every other voice that is out there. And so today we're gonna hear the voice of God, and one of the things we're learning through Revelation is that to comprehend what John is saying and describing, we need to listen intently. In fact, John is actually gonna craft his message not for the eye, but for the ear. Right, that's how he's crafting his mouth. So if we wanna see, we have to hear better. And we're gonna take that into chapter one. So if you have a Bible, turn with me, or an iPad or a smartphone, turn with me, or, or a cell phone, turn with me to Revelation chapter one. And by God's grace, we will prayerfully, finally get through chapter one. Can I get an amen? It's only taken us since the beginning of the, the year. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully move a little faster, but so much, I told, I told somebody this morning, it's like mining gold every week in the study, you know, just like mining. And that's how the Bible works. It doesn't matter if you're a new Christian or a longtime believer, every time you read and study the word of God, you could turn it, the rabbi said, like a diamond, and it shines with a different prism or perspective. Isn't that cool how the Bible works? Uh, if you have a Bible, well, we like to say word at Long Hollow. So if you're there, uh, you're in the chapel or at home, you can say word. The word of the Lord. I, John, the one who's writing, your brother and partner in the affliction. Now, right in your margin, that word affliction in Greek is actually the word tribulation. In the tribulation, in the kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus Christ was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, here's an interesting, I don't have time to do it now, but I wanna show you something. Contrary to popular opinion, John, I don't believe, wrote the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos. Why? Because what is the tense of this word? Was, past tense, so he's off the island. I'm gonna make the case in the weeks ahead that he's writing from the church of Ephesus where he's already back from. So he's showing us he got this revelation in the past when he was on the island. Now, how did it happen? I was in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, which is just a code word for the Messiah, Jesus, dressed in a robe and with a white golden sash wrapped around his chest. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, I'm asking this morning to give us ears to see and see in such a way that we comprehend and Obey, God, we wanna hear today, so 
Help us to tune out the distracting voices and be locked and loaded, laser focused on your word for just this brief time we have together. God, I feel like some of the insights and truths we'll learn today will have bearing on our life, not just this week, but for the rest of our existence. So speak to us now. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. I wanna pull out three uh, truths from this text that I really believe will apply to us wherever we are in life. Here's the first one. John's gonna show us that our worship is not confined to a building. Did you catch that? Our worship is not confined to a building. So the year right here is AD 96, okay? This is roughly when John is writing uh, the book of Revelation. He's on the island of Patmos, I'll show you a map, which is right on the southern coast of Turkey uh, or Asia Minor, Minor when he received this revelation. Just, just a kind of a sidebar plug. Uh, I'm leading, Candy and I will lead a trip in October, haven't even promoted it yet, so you're hearing it for the first time, to these seven churches where you will walk and see with your own eyes. And of all the churches, as we're gonna see in the weeks to come, Ephesus is the crowning jewel of the empire. It's the third largest city in all of the Roman Empire, and it will be an amazing. So that will be uh, in October. If you're interested, you can find more information. But you're gonna see this with your own eyes. And what John says is, listen, I'm here with you guys. I'm a part of the suffering with you in three ways. Look what he says. I'm a part of the suffering in the affliction or tribulation, in the kingdom, and in what? In the endurance of the saints. Now, I want you to notice the tense of that word. Is that present tense or future tense? Present, I am with you in the tribulation. So in a real sense, yes, the tribulation's coming, time of trial. Yes, in a real sense, the kingdom's coming one day, but John's saying, I'm also experiencing this today, right? Now, let me just say for the record, I feel like I have to say that, even though I said this weeks ago, like, hey, we can agree to disagree, listen to the whole sermon series, don't leave the church, don't get mad, let's be. I have to say this, for the record, I want you to hear this. I believe in the rapture, okay. Everybody with me? This is yes, this is great, everybody, okay. okay. I believe in the rapture. I believe in a tribulation season time period, okay? I also believe in a kingdom because Revelation speaks of that. But here's what I've realized as I started studying Revelation over the last year. A lot of what I was taught in seminary and by popular books today, when I compare it to the Bible, it's very different than what John saw. It's very different than how John explains it. So once again, I just wanna give kind of a plug. Don't get your feathers fluffered, uh, uh, ruffled, ruffled, okay, I was gonna say something. <laughs> ruffled, <laughs> fluttered, ruffled. <laughs> Both those words are not good words to even try to tell me. But anyway, just stay with us, okay? Are you, is that okay, everybody on the same page? Right, this is yes. This is not, okay, we're on the same page, okay. John is experiencing right here what I'm calling a one-man revival. This is a man who is caught up in the spirit of God, worshiping the Lord while he's imprisoned on an island. There's no church building in sight. There's no choir, there's no orchestra, there's no praise team, there's no instruments, there is no sermon to be preached, and yet John is worshiping the Lord by himself. Uh, uh, himself. I want you to hear this. His circumstances do not hinder his worship of God. You know what he does? He turns a prison into a praise service. How cool is that? Like into a praise service. Now, he knows other guys who've done that, and in fact, we do too. When you study the book of Acts, you'll see repeatedly that one man is always in trouble. He's always persecuted. He's always thrown in prison. And instead of doing what we would have a tendency to wanna do, he does just the opposite. Turn to Acts 16, and I wanna show you what happens when Paul and Silas are thrown in prison. Watch this, I, I love this passage. Let me give you the context. Paul goes to Philippi, a, a city of, of Greece, and uh, he comes preaching the good news of the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's encountering a woman who is filled with a, a spirit of divination. She can tell the future. She's a fortune teller. And uh, I, I think it's just comical that the townspeople don't recognize Paul as a man of God, but the demonic, demoniac, the, 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 the demon-filled woman does. 
Like she's like, hey, these men are of God, right? And so Paul does a good thing. He casts out the demon from this woman who's been tormented and used by the demon. And so you think, man, that's a good thing. Let's honor Paul. Thanks for coming. What do they do? They get mad, they beat them with rods and they throw them in prison. And so what do you expect Paul to do? Like he's in prison, he's chained at night. What do you expect him to do, complain? All right, well, is he mad at God? Is he pointing the finger? Like really, God? is he pouting? No, they praise God in prison. Watch this, Acts 16, 25. The text says about midnight. Now, I don't wanna make much of this, but I think it's a wink from God that at midnight, at the darkest point of the night, at, at, the, at the darkest point of your trial, watch what they do. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. You and I have no idea how when we use our platform of suffering, how that impacts people around us for the gospel. We have no idea the people that are watching us professing to be so-called Christians, how we suffer for the gospel. So the prisoners were listening and then suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came off. I'm gonna go on record and say, Elvis Presley ain't got nothing on this worship service, amen? Like this is when the jailhouse first rocked, would you agree? I mean, this is really what had happened. I mean, and here's what Paul's teaching us, don't miss this. Paul's teaching us that we have a platform that we can use when we suffer to preach the gospel and praise God. The Lord. Now, I know some of you are saying, but you don't understand how bad it is. You don't understand what I'm going through. I don't. But I do know, as bad as it is, you can find one thing to praise God for. Here's the principle. Write this down. You're going to want to remember this. Here's the principle in Scripture. When our praises go up, God's presence comes down. Watch this. When our praises go up, our presence comes down. I know what you're thinking. Prove it in the Bible. I'm glad you asked. Here it is. Well, I said, this, is the, this is what the Bible says. Psalm 22, 3. Here's what God's word says. God inhabits the praise of his people. Now, you're going to love this word. In the language of the Old Testament, the word inhabits is where we get the word dwell or abide. Here's what that means. When you praise God, he dwells among you. He abides with you. He lingers with you and beside you. And here's the thing, while John is praising the God, now he's not manipulating the spirit, he's not manufacturing a move of God, he is unexpectedly overwhelmed by the spirit and he sees the revelation. And it shows us something. As Christians, we are, yes, filled with the spirit at salvation. We all have the spirit. He does not have the spirit of Christ, does not belong to Christ, Paul said. However, you know this, there are unexpected, surprising times in the Christian life when we sense the palpable presence of God. You know what I'm talking about? Now, we can't manufacture, manipulate, but boy, we're thankful when it happens. And I tell you that to tell you this, I can't promise you that every time you praise God, his presence is felt. But I can promise you, you will never sense his presence when you complain or pout. So let me ask you, just a little family time here. I want you to just say it out loud. What is something today you can personally just say, hey, I, I praise God right now for this. What, what would you say? Just say it out loud. Just something you could praise the Lord for. Family, what else? Your marriage, health, love, your job. What's that? grace and your life. You could see that even as bad as it is, you have something that you can praise God for. Our praises go up, his presence comes down. Number two, here's the second insight here. And this was surprising this week, you're gonna see, or two weeks ago when I saw this and blew me away. And here's the insight that John's gonna teach us. Our advantage as a Christian is that we can hear from God. That's the advantage we have over a lost world. That, 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 that's what makes it unfair. That, that, that's what gives us in video game a power up, right? Like this is the, makes us OP as my kids say. Like this is it, right? <laughs> this is it. 
So Paul's gonna show, John's gonna show, this is the unfair advantage. John chapter, or Revelation chapter one, verse 14. He's describing Jesus here, and here's what he sees, watch this. The hair of Jesus' head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame, his feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace. And his voice, you can almost hear it, like the sound of cascading, like a, like a waterfall, cascading water falling. He had seven stars in his right hand and a double-edged sword coming from his mouth. Now, this is not a long sword you take into battle. This is more of a short Makaira sword. Think the little, the little dagger like uh, Peter cut the ear with uh, of the soldier in the garden. Star, sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. Now, I talk about this a lot. Uh, the Jewish people did not have the use of bold and italics and, and parentheses and quotation marks, but what they had was the language. And so they used the language in a literary way to give emphasis to something. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. One of the ways they did this was by using something called a chiasm, okay? C-H-I-A-S-M, if you're interested, chiasm. It's from the Greek word chi, or the Greek letter chi, watch this, which is, if you know your Greek from like fraternity, sorority, is the letter X, okay? That's what chi is, the letter X. They don't take this side of the X, they take this side of the X, which is a V turned sideways, and it's important that we know that, why? Because the emphasis is in the middle. Now, contrast to the Western American way we think. When I want to emphasize something to you in literature or in the American language, what I use is a bullet point or a number system whereby I'm giving you numbers and the emphasis goes to the end. So if I give you a list of seven things, the most important thing is at the end. Number seven, I'm building up to it. That's not how the Jewish culture thinks. They actually think with, with the chiasm or the centerpiece being important of the V. I'll show you how it works. This is how it works. And I'm telling you, once you learn this, like some of you are gonna be dangerous <laughs> for your own good. Once you, I mean, listen, you will be up all night. I'm just telling you, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Okay? I took a whole Hebrew class uh, years ago on this and everywhere. Okay, watch this. This is how it works. The first line is 1A, second line is 2A, or the second phrase. The third phrase is 3A, 4, 3B, 2B, 1A. And the focal point, the center, drawing your attention is the mid middle. Let me give you an example. Turn with me to Psalm 6, or I'm sorry, Proverbs 6. Turn with me to Proverbs 6. Okay, this is a very familiar proverb, and uh, you'll see how this works. Proverbs 6, 16. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable. Now, you're going to start to see all this start to make sense. Why is the number seven probably the most used number in all the Jewish Hebrew language? Because seven is odd, which always leaves a center. Always. Three and three to the center. You're going to see it. Seven things are detestable. An arrogant eye or arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. We Westerners read this and we say, wow, seven things. That's really bad things to do, which you're right. But the author of Proverbs, Solomon, said all these things are bad, but there's something in the center that is the root of all evil. It's the root of all evil. It's the heart of the problem. Watch this. So I've done, what I've done is I've, I've color-coded them so you can see. So 1A, 1B are in, uh, what is it, teal. Uh, 2A, 2B are in yellow. 3A, 3B are in purple. And uh, go Tigers. And then the centerpiece, the centerpiece <laughs> is... Uh, is uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs. The centerpiece for my wife, my wife, diehard Kansas City. But anyway, 18, 18 is the center. Okay, let's follow this. Watch how it works. The first one, uh, arrogant eyes, and the last one, one who stirs up trouble among his brothers, talks about someone who's prideful. 
Arrogant eyes, a pride for God. One who stirs up trouble means they're right, okay? The first one is 1A, 1B, lying. I mean, pride. Number two, second one's easy. A lying tongue and a lying witness who gives false testimony. What is this about? Someone who lies. 2A, 2B. The third one is about your actions. Hands that shed innocent blood and feet eager to run to evil. Body parts, hands, are actions. And what this is about is a person, the way they live. Now watch this. Which leads us to the centerpiece of all things, which is a heart that plots wicked schemes. Here's what he's saying. The heart of the problem is a problem of your heart. See, when your heart's wrong, the body follows. When your heart is right, then everything follows. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, why do I tell you this? Did you know Revelation 1 is a chiasm? John, when I found this, I, was, I mean, this is gonna blow you away of what John's trying to show us. Okay, watch this. Turn with me to Revelation 1, and I wanna show you the chiasm of Revelation 1 and what John is trying to teach us in this text here. Okay, now when he describes Jesus, here's what he's gonna do. He's gonna say, Jesus looked like this. Here's what I saw. I saw his head white as wool or white as snow, and then I saw his eyes, look at the end, his face, which is um, verse 16, his face was shining like the sun at full strength. His head and his face are the same, and here's what he's saying. He is of infinite wisdom, okay? Number two, we see his eyes and his mouth. He said he had eyes that were like fiery flames and had a mouth that had a double-edged sword coming out. So the mouth and the eyes, get this, are synonymous with features of the body. They're both the same. His eyes are perfect. His words are penetrating. Why? To cleanse us from sin, okay? The third one. He said his feet are like bronze fired in a furnace and his hand holds seven stars in his right hand. And remember, feet and hands are actions, things you do. So those are synonymous. And basically what he's saying is his life is perfect. He goes where he wants, does what he wants, but his hand holds the seven stars, which we'll learn in a moment, are the messengers of the church. So what does that leave? What is he saying? He's in control of everything. What does that leave? The center, this is the center. And I heard, you ready for this? His voice like that of cascading waters. And what he's saying is his voice is the only voice that drowns out every other voice in your life vying for your attention. Here's what he's showing us. He's showing us, coming close, the importance of hearing the voice of God. I wanna ask you today, as you think about the Christian life and the disciplines of the Christian life, what is, in your estimation, what is the number one most essential discipline that is also the most overlooked spiritual discipline in your life? And I know it's in your life because it's been in mine for years and years. What is the most overlooked spiritual discipline? What would you say? Prayer's a big one. Anybody think we can all, who could think they could do better at prayer? Okay. If you don't raise your hand, you're lying, so raise your hand for lying. <laughs> right? You just lied. <laughs> okay, we all can do better prayer. What about reading the Bible? That's important. What about memorizing scripture, right? What about evangelizing, the discipline of evangelizing? What about worshiping, more passion? All those things are good, but I would say they fail in comparison to what John's saying. John's saying the secret weapon for the Christian is the fact that they can hear the voice of God. You see, we have the same problem today as the church did back then. See, the church of Asia Minor was getting influenced by all the voices of their culture. They heard the worldly influences of the culture. They were listening to the seductive voices of Rome. They were hearing the threatening voices of the mission. Now, we don't hear those. Here's what we hear. We hear the fearful voices on the news, the immoral voices from Hollywood, the arrogant voices from Washington, and the critical voices from TikTok and Twitter. Can I get an amen? That's what we hear today, right? And I think this is why John, you're gonna love this. 
Every single church, we're gonna study them next week, there's seven of them. Every church, there's a message and he finishes with this line seven times. He does it in Revelation 2, 7, Revelation 2, 11, Revelation 2, 17, Revelation 2, 29, Revelation chapter 3, verse 6, Revelation 3, 13, Revelation 3, 22. Seven times, right? He does this. Let he who has ears hear, every time, hear what the Spirit says to the church. I was reading that this week and I was wondering, are we listening to what the Spirit is saying to Long Hollow? Or better yet, are you listening to what the Spirit is saying to your family? For your workplace, for your home. See, the Bible's clear. I mean, you see it all through the Bible. Guess how many times the word hear or listen is found in the entire Bible? Staggering. 700 times. And this is even more amazing. 500 of the 700 are commands from God. It's not like not, not an option. Like you don't need, you know, it's not that I wanna hear, I don't, blah, 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 blah. no, you don't do that with God. When God speaks, you listen, right? James chapter one, verse 19 is a perfect one. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to speak and slow to hear. That's what I do, right? That's my problem. If you just listen to me, man, I could tell you, no, I got great about it. Why don't you sit there and I'll show you. That's what we do. That's not what, that's not what James says. James says, watch this, I'm not preaching on this, but if you have an anger problem, I would say you probably don't listen well. Probably don't listen well. Because he says, be quick to listen, slow to speak. Think about this. The greatest prayer, the crescendo of all scripture in the Old Testament is Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema. What is the first word of the Shema? Hear. <laughs> Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord is our God. Paul says it this way. The very faith we have was initiated by hearing. What does he say? Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. Now here's the thing. Hearing began your Christian life. But I know in a room this size, sadly, some of you haven't heard the voice of God since you got saved. See, the greatest advantage we have as a Christian against the lost world is our ability to hear from the commander in chief in the battle, right? And I don't know about you, I could use wisdom that I can call upon from someone who has a different vantage point than I can see, amen? We hear the voice of God, yes, through the word of God. I mean, we listen to the word and we read the word. That's one of the best ways we hear the word of God. You know what they say is, a life that's falling apart does not belong to a Bible that is. A life that's falling apart doesn't belong to a Bible. Because when, a Bi when you have a Bible that falls apart, it doesn't belong to a life that is. You can't say I don't hear from God if you have a closed Bible on the, on the bedstand, uh, the nightstand by the bedside, right? So we hear from God through the word, but there's another way we hear from God. It's through, and I've learned this more recently, by sitting in silence and stillness to be with God. You know, years ago, Dan Rather, a CBS anchor a reporter was interviewing Mother Teresa. And uh, he was wanting to inquire about her prayer life. The conversation turned to that. One of the godliest women who ever walked the face of the earth, obviously, that we know about. And uh, so he was asking her, he said, tell me about your prayer life. W what does your prayer life look like? And Mother Teresa said, well, I listen. And uh, Rather said, oh, that's interesting. Well, what does God say? And she said, well, he listens. rather puzzled, he sat there for a moment trying to figure out what she's talking about. And she said these words, I've never forgotten these words. She said, if you don't understand that, then I can't explain it to you. See, Jesus said it this way, my sheep know me and they what? Hear my voice. You know, sometimes when I'm sitting with the Lord alone in the presence of God, I've realized that sometimes words are not needed to hear what God is saying. 
I want to ask you personally, when was the last time you got a word from God? You got a word for your family. When was the last time you got a word for your for your kids? When was the last time you got a word for your spouse? When was the last time you got a word for your future, for your finances? Or let me ask it this way. When was the last time you even tried? Even made time, extended the effort to hear the voice. When was the last time you tried to bend your ear to the accent of the Holy Spirit speaking to your life? John said, that's the greatest weapon we have over a lost world hearing. The greatest tragedy is to get to heaven and have the ability to hear from God, but never spend time to do it. Number three, here's the final one. And this one really is the, is the whole book of, of Revelation, the whole purpose of our sermon. And here's, here's what John's going to teach us. Our perspective in life on everything is changed by Jesus's position. Our perspective is changed by Jesus's position. Look at verse 17. He says, when I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. You see, that was the only thing the devil held over humanity's head until Jesus rose from the dead is the fact that we died. And some thought that was the end of it. And what Jesus is saying, look, I've come back from the dead, and so the devil is totally disarmed because look who's holding the keys. I got the keys to death and Hades, right? Therefore, write what you've seen, John, what is and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. So he's gonna explain it to us, watch this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, I said this at the beginning, but I wanna repeat this. The position of Jesus changes our perspective of everything, okay? The position of Jesus, and I want you to go back just for a moment, look in your Bible. I want you to look above this section and I want you to start in, in, chapter, in verse nine and just kind of look, and I want you to notice where is Jesus standing when he's speaking? Where is Jesus standing when he appears? I want you to look real quick. Notice where he is. I'll give you a hint. Verse 13. Watch what it says. It says Jesus. Now the CSB translates it and tries to interpret it, but I think they lose the heart of it. But, but the CSB says Jesus was what? among the lampstands. I don't think that's strong enough. Let me give you another way to look at it. Jesus was in the middle of the lampstands. He's right in the middle. See, the lampstands are the seven churches. And it shows us, I love this. Jesus is not outside the churches. Jesus is not above the churches. Jesus is not on the fringe of the church. No, where's Jesus? Jesus is in the middle. He's like right in the middle of his people. He's not on the fringe, not in the margin, not outside, not far away. No, Jesus is right at the center of everything. And he's not just at the center of the churches. Watch this. He's at the center of worship. Revelation 5, turn there real quick, verse 6. We're going to read this in a couple of weeks. Revelation 5, 6, we're going to see this wonderful worship service on Easter Sunday. It's going to be unbelievable, I think. At least I... I've already had a few one-man worship services in my home when I read it, so go back and read it. So hopefully, it'll be impactful on Easter. But watch this, Revelation 5, 6. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing where? In the middle. I want you to get this, in the middle. He's in the middle. He's in the midst of the throne of heaven. Why is that important? Because Jesus is in the middle of worship. Jesus is in the middle of the churches. Jesus is the centerpiece of everything. Now, why are you belaboring the point? Look at me, Long Hollow. The reason we as Christians think we're losing, because if you look around, you say, ah, oh, we're losing, man, we're losing everything, is because, watch this, we feel marginalized as believers. Meaning, we feel like we've been pushed to the fringe and the world has taken our place. Now, in a, in a real sense in America, that's pretty much happened, right? I mean, you gotta remember, there, there was a time in America where most of the country went to church. I mean, that's what you did. Like you were a Christian, you were a Christian you're in, especially in the South. You're in the South, you go to church, right? 
It wasn't a time very long ago where you could walk into any courtroom in any city in America and see boldly and plainly the 10 commandments of God placed on the wall. It wasn't very long ago where you would have the Bible being at least referred to, if not taught, in public schools. There was a time in Sumner County not long ago when pastors were allowed to go to the lunchroom and talk to our students who went to Long Hollow. Let me remind you, those days are over. And as we read Revelation and just see how things are progressing, we are not going back to the nostalgic days. Let me just newsflash. We're not going back. It's actually gonna get increasingly worse. And if we don't understand this, I think we're caught off guard. Let me just say one more thing that I think is fascinating. Do you remember 30 years ago? If you went to, if you were a part of a church, 30 years ago, if you missed a Sunday and didn't go to church, you had to explain to your neighbors why you didn't go. Right, remember that? Ah, we got busy, you know, this. The day we live in today, you ready for this? If you go to church on Sunday and come home, you have to explain to your neighbors why you went. Right? So where are we living today? And we can get discouraged when we think we're the outsiders. We get discouraged when our perspective is on the wrong path position or the wrong person, but I don't want you to be deceived. That's what John said. There's something going on behind the curtain that you don't know about. And so let me tell you what he would say. Wall Street, with all due respect, is not the center of all things of the world. Washington, D.C. and all the politics, with all due respect, that it comes with it, is not the center of all things in this world. The Congress of the United States, the House of Representatives, is not the center of all things. Do you believe that? Tesla and Elon Musk, with all due respect, you're not the center of all things. Apple and all the gadgets that come is not the center of all things. Hollywood, thank you, Jesus, is not the center of all things. And California can keep thinking they're the center of all things, but it's not. America's not the center. Jesus Christ is the center of everything. Why? Because he's in the middle. He's in the middle. And when your perspective gets changed, you forget that. That's what he's saying. Listen, guys, I hold the keys. I got the keys to death. Hell, I got the stars in one hand. I got the lampstands over here. I'm in control of everything at every time. And I love this. He's here with us today. He's here. So let us not just distracted by dwelling on the wrong things. Let us not be discouraged when we watch the news today because we can get discouraged today. Remember, God is doing something so big behind the scenes that we wouldn't understand it even if he told us. And so here's my challenge. Let us center ourselves on the one who's at the center of all things, the one who's with us all the time. I wanna leave you with one more chiasm, which I think is one of the coolest in in the Bible as far as, as it goes to this, Jesus being the center in the middle. It's the most beloved Psalm in the Old Testament, my opinion, Psalm 23. You'll never see it again the same way. It's not a traditional chiasm, A, B, C, middle, C, B, A. It's a chiasm in the sense of there's a, there's a beginning section, there's an ending section, and there's the centerpiece of the psalm. And it's a chiasm based on words and the word count. I'll show you the psalm. And you know this well, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me uh, to drink out of still waters. He leads me along paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk to the valley of the shout, you know the psalm pretty well. The psalm has in it, Uh, in its entirety, 55 Hebrew words, 55 Hebrew words. You can actually take the first 26 words in Hebrew and the last 26 words in Hebrew, and if you break them apart, there is a center phrase of three words, the very center of the song, three words. And if you do that, it looks like this. This is the centerpiece of the most beloved, most comforting song in the entire Bible. For you, God, are with me. Here's what God's speaking to you today. If you're in the deepest valley of life, God's with you. If you climb to the highest 
peak of a mountain. He's also with you, he's up there. But when you walk through the darkest season, some of you are there, you need to know and be reminded, God is with you. When you lie down in the greenest fields you've ever seen and drink from the freshest water you've ever tasted, God is with you there, but he's also with you as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. As you're navigating cancer right now, as you're experiencing the effects of a stroke or health issue, when you lose a loved one, he's right there with you. When your marriage falls apart and you've done everything to try to bring it back together, when you're navigating life with a son or a daughter who's battling addiction and can't seem to get ahead, when you contemplate suicide, he's there with you. When you're being persecuted for your faith, for doing the right thing, it says God is with us. And so here's my loving reminder. Let's keep our eyes on the one who is in the middle of everything. So where are you looking right now? Are you looking to the middle or are you looking out to the margins? Isn't it cool to know we have a God who is with us in the middle of every mess we'll ever face in life? And so I just wanna pray over us now. Would, would you just bow your head for a moment? And this is for everyone in here today. I want you to put your things aside because I feel that some of you are in the middle of something right now where you say, man, I need, I need it. I'm in the middle of a, a dark season, a difficult, difficult valley of life, and I need to know this. And so I just want you to put everything aside. And I want you to be silent before the Lord. Take a deep breath and just exhale out. you to be honest before God. What are you worried about right now? What are you fearful of? It's okay to be honest with God. You don't tell me, tell, tell the Lord. Don't say it out loud, but you can scream it in your heart to God. What are you afraid of? I want you to name that right now and I want you to offer it up to the one who is right with us now, in the middle of this worship service, in the middle of our church today, in the middle of your home as you're watching, in the center of your life right now. And, and would you ask Jesus, who holds the keys to all things, to use those keys to set you free from anxiety or fear or worry, Jesus, we need to be reminded over and over that you're in the middle with us. You're not a God who rules from above or a guy who, God who speaks from a distance. No, you're right here in the middle. You were in the middle with those brothers and sisters in the first century who were losing their lives and felt like they were losing the battle, and yet you were in the middle. And we don't understand it all, but some kind of way you work all things, even bad things, together for the good. And so God, would you wrap your arms around those today who would say, man, I really need to know today. I really need to be reminded that God is with me. He's in the middle. I pray you wrap your arms around each person in this place and let them know you are near. God, your silence is not absence. Just because we don't always hear your voice doesn't mean you are not present with us and even working. God, when we're down to nothing, you're always up to something. And we know through the worst times of life, you work the best. And so I just pray now, God, remind us of that truth. Manifest your presence in a palpable way to, to let us know you're here and you are near. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for not leaving us or forsaking us. You're right in the middle of the middle of everything. We ask it in Jesus' name.